Uh, every year, the, the elementary school asks me to come and share at their convocation or whatever. And so, uh, and as some of you know, that's the one time of the year that I'm completely terrified. <laughs> you know? And it's crazy because I go in and share in prisons and I go and travel and I teach in different places and I meet people, new people all the time. But to go into the elementary school and try to communicate, I just, I get locked up and I'm sweating and, you know, and, and so every year they ask me to do this. And so I usually have a year of preparation. And they give me three dates to choose from and they know it by now. I always choose the last one they gave me, at least the last moment. So I've been thinking last year, and they also have each month two character qualities. Like this month it was responsibility and diligence. And most people teach on whatever those qualities are and give a Bible message in regard to that. But last year, I just felt like God had put a word in my heart on repentance. And then that made me even maybe more terrified because I thought, how do I share repentance to kindergarten through fifth graders? And, uh, and so I was thinking about that all year long. And, and last week, I don't know about here, but up in Tyler, had a big thunderstorm, rainstorm. Boom! Bam! Even a Monday night, I'd gone to pick my daughter up somewhere, and like lightning flashed, like right in front of me, and it just immediately, bah! So, and I love that kind of stuff. I mean, I just, I think that's great. And so, uh, it was still doing that in the morning, and I went to the school, and and just some thoughts that I shared with them. You know, <clears throat> the gospel, and what was interesting too is they they quote the Nicene Creed until I guess they learn it. So. I believe, da 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 da, I believe, da 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 da, you know, Jesus born of a virgin and all this stuff. And so I was sharing with them, you know, Jesus, when he came, it says he came preaching the gospel. And he said, repent and believe. And so often we focus on the simpler words that, not that believing is even simple, but, but it's not as... It's not like the crack of lightning that repentance brings. There's something about the word repent that brings a, a crackling of lightning and a thunder of sound. And we tend to negate that part. Just believe. And we set out, the, we, we cut out, we, we overlook that part of repent. And so as I was relating to these kids, it's, it is, it's like the thunderstorm that comes through and the lightning is necessary to clear the air so that the, the, the air doesn't become stale. And so we talked about that and then simplifying it. And again, this is a extremely simplified, but repentance is basically being able to say, I'm sorry. You know, I know it's a change of mind and there's a lot more to it. But it's 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 being able and without being able to say I'm sorry, you're not going to have a healthy relationship with God or man. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's the thing that keeps us from saying I'm sorry? Pride. Yeah. As I was sharing with them, listen, if you can become comfortable with this key, with this word, you're going to have a healthy relationship with God and man. Listen, repentance is how we change. None of us are batting a thousand. We're all dysfunctional. And the mystery of this gospel is how he takes this dysfunctional heart that's filled with all kinds of stuff, and through this journey, he begins to conform it into the nature into his nature. But the only way that happens is a word called sanctification, which is basically repentance. It's, it's me coming to the light and being willing to say, Lord, forgive me. And so, tonight, as I move forward, there's a word on my mind. And it's connected with Psalms 119. You'll see it in a minute. But I am a little, I'm, 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 I, I'm passionate about all the Bible studies. But I am passionate about this Bible study because I believe that it is important and I believe that it's necessary. And as I share about it, I want to remind you that that word that we're going to look at is um, um, discernment. The ability to discern. We'll see later one of the, 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 the purposes of the shepherds that they had neglected is that they had not taught the people to discern between good and evil between bitter and sweet. And so, and so there was no discernment, no ability to judge. 
And I find a passage that's really interesting. It's in 1 John chapter 2. And it's when John writes to the church. He's writing to the church. And he says, you have no need for anyone to teach you. Now think about that. He was teaching them as he was saying that. And what's interesting to me is that John wasn't threatened by that. He wasn't threatened by the fact you have each been given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into truth. And yet, God has established a fivefold ministry. <coughs> Pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle, prophet. All of those have a gifting and a function. And most all of those gifts involve teaching. But I'll tell you, if our teaching draws men to us to be dependent upon us, then guys, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That teaching should always be to cultivate in each one of us the, the ability to discern and know the voice of God. And so, as we look at this in Matthew chapter 24, the whole chapter is, is looking forward to the, the last days, but we're going to look at verse 1, and it says, And Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now, before we read on, it's so easy to read that and go, Oh yeah, the disciples were looking at the temple and Jesus said none of these things... For me, the way I meditate Scripture, I put myself in it from all directions and I consider it. Think about it. You know, you're walking out of whatever the temple of your day is. <coughs> walking out of your church or walking out of the big this or the big that. And you just are amazed at the architecture and what it looks like. And Jesus is walking with you and he's just moving forward. You're coming out of the synagogue or walking down the street and you say... Jesus, look at the beauty of these buildings. And Jesus just looks at you and he says, Listen, guys, not one stone that you're looking at is going to be left for another. All of this stuff is coming down. And basically, one of the things he was conveying is that God does not dwell in a temple made with hands. He dwells in a body, in a people. This is the church. Now listen, the church can meet inside the temple. But Jesus gave no credibility to the temple itself. He was not moved by the building. And so they're coming out, and it says later, and I always love when it says later. Because so often we have these imaginations of what the disciples were like. Listen, sometimes they didn't get it. Sometimes they were like, huh? And it says, verse 3, And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place but they are not yet the end. Skip down with me to verse 10. And at that time, or verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations on account of mine. My <coughs> at that time, many will fall away, fall away and, will dis and will deliver up one another and hate one another. And false prophets will arise and will, mis will mislead many. And because lawlessness has increased, most people with love will grow cold. Now think about this. It begins to say people will deliver up one another. Become offended toward one another. And because lawlessness has increased, what is lawlessness? Breaking God's law. What is God's law? You shall love your Lord your God. and love others. All right? So he says, you can see before that they're going to deliver up one another. They're going to hate one another. And you're going to see these things begin to happen. Men are not loving God with all their heart, nor their neighbors or self. And because lawlessness has increased, the love of many will grow cold. 
Because we're not challenged. What does it say in the scripture? It says challenge. It says encourage one another in love. Listen, do you need to be encouraged in that? Listen, in relationship to your wife, your husband, children. Listen, sometimes in regard to, to you know, work or wherever. I was just talking, you know, with, with a, a friend and I said, listen, the end result of this gospel is Christ being formed in your heart. What does that look like? 1 Corinthians 13. If you can speak with the tongues of men and of angels but love has not been performed in your heart, then it means nothing. If you can know all mysteries and love not be performed in your heart, it means nothing. If you give all your possessions to the poor and give your body to be burned but don't have love in your heart, it doesn't mean anything. All right, well, what is love if that's what you're saying? Love is patient. All right? How are you going to have the opportunity to be patient unless there's not the same opportunity to be impatient? Love is kind. When the opportunity to, to fight words with words, and all of a sudden, God says, speak kindly. Now listen, these relationships are necessary even the ones that bring us the most pain. Because those are the places where God's saying, right here is where I'm teaching you. This is your seminary. It's the place where you're walking. All the head knowledge in the world doesn't mean a thing until you learn this right here to lay down your life. And so he says, listen, the first thing he says about the last days, be careful that no one misleads you. Be careful that no one misleads you. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, speaking to Timothy, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And will turn away their ears from listening to the truth. And will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, and your hardship, do work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So think about this. He says, listen, there's coming a time when people will turn away from hearing truth. And they will begin to gravitate towards someone who will tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear. What does that look like? Listen. Nowadays. Yeah, well, well if, 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 if I am living in adultery or fornication, I don't want to sit in a place where somebody is exposing right. adultery and fornication. You know, I was talking with somebody years ago, years ago, and uh, they were a Sunday school teacher, and, and we were sitting down, and, and they just started sharing about, you know, these fornication, and these different relationships, and, and I was just sitting there, and I said, well, I just want you to consider some things, and I want to put this in front of you, I want to get your thoughts about it. I said, I can tell you what I think about it when I read it, but I said, it says right here, those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What are you going to do with that? Well, but okay, all right, I'm just, how about this one over here? Where it says, and I went to three or four passages, and I can tell the, the, the conversation was shut down a little bit. And so, hey, listen, all I can do on my part is give you my consideration, show you the verses here. So we're going through it, and we were leaving, and walking out in the parking lot, and he was leaving, and I was leaving, I said, uh, I said, um, so where are you headed now? And he looks down. He said, you've messed me up. I said, it was, then we're laughing. I mean, it was lighthearted. I said, what, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I know I'm going over to my girlfriend's house. I said, okay. And he said, and I know we're going to sleep together tonight. And he said, you've just messed that up with all this stuff you've just shared. Because now, now it's bothering me. And I said, well, you shouldn't be bothered. That's the reason I shared it with you. It should stir you. 
But listen, when we don't want to hear something, when we don't want our heart to be challenged, we're going to gravitate toward places that make us feel comfortable. That we And you know what? While we do it, there's something that says, I know there's more. But because I'm not willing to come to the light, I gravitate toward teachers and people that will tell me things that I want to hear rather than the things that I need to hear. Mm -hmm. Just like several or a month ago we, we shared about, I'm a companion of those who fear the Lord. And listen, we have lots of friendships. But I'm going to tell you, the ones that are closest to us should be willing to wound us. Mm -hmm. Those are true friends. The ones that consider our life more important than our friendship. And they're willing to say hard things for our good, even for a season if it costs us the friendship. Those are the kind of people I want my life. Mm -hmm. People that will be honest when I need it. And so, not willing to hear. Look with me now in Psalms 119. Well, Here's the, Psalms 119 and verse 65. So, when Jesus is talking about the last days, he says, he says, take heed, lest anyone mislead you. That word mislead, you know what it means? To cause to wander. He says, listen, there are going to be those that are going to say things and share things that are going to cause you to want to wander from the path of life, to wander from the commandments, to wander from relationship with Christ. Well, Lord, what do I do? I don't want to wander. I want to be true. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. All right? Psalms 119 and verse 65. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in thy commandments. And we're going to spend next week on these next passages. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep thy word. Thou art good and dost good. Teach me thy statutes. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. With all of my heart, I will observe thy precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So as he gets into this, the heart cry of the psalmist begins to say, Lord, teach me good discernment and knowledge. Teach me good judgment. The Lord wants us to have judgment. He wants us to be able to discern. One of the things as you're reading the Proverbs, it says, listen, you simple-minded. Those, it's, it means open-minded. Just open to all of this. He says, follow me. Let me speak to you. Let me show you. And there's, a, there's an idea in our society today. We all need to be open-minded. And you know what? There are things that we need to be open-minded about in regard to maybe certain decisions. You know, uh, um, how, you know, going to the, how, you know, I'm trying to find my way through that too. Co college, you know, uh, kids going to college and one wanting to, you know, is it better to go to Christian college or, you know, this college or uh, is it better to go to trade school? Is it better to this? And, you know, sometimes you can be so single-minded that you begin to live their life for them. I mean, you know, there's, there's places to be open, to listen. But I'm telling you what, guys, His Word is absolute and it is true. And I've been in places where Christians sit around and discuss whether or not there actually is a judgment. Whether there is a hell. How could a loving God cast people to hell? That doesn't make sense to me. And so we begin to, to, to look at this, oh, well, maybe that. And then we begin to wash away the Word of God. We just begin cutting things out. We just begin neglecting things. We just begin to make up our own God and our own image and God says, you thought that I was like you. Mm. And he's not. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that he says, listen, you need good discernment. Where do you get that from? Him. And it starts with crying out, Lord, teach me good discernment. Look with me. 
in Matthew chapter 7. And as you turn there, you remember in the <clears throat> Second Kings, the story of Solomon, I know you do. And Solomon had become king, the Lord came to him in a vision. He says, whatever I, you want that I'll give you, he asked for good discernment judgment he might lead thy people you ever put yourself in that position think about this right now tonight hopefully you'll be inspired by this message but uh, tonight you have a dream and God comes to you in the night and he says to you whatever you want think about that whatever you want I will give it to you do we put value and importance on good judgment and discernment. Solomon, feeling the weight of the kingdom, could have asked for anything, but he knew what was necessary, that he would be able to discern good and evil, that he would be able to judge rightly. Is it less, any less important for us today if the Lord put it before you, what would you desire? Would our desire be, God, give me good judgment? And when the Lord heard that from Solomon's heart, you know the story, he gave him all that Solomon didn't even ask for. Because he asked for at that moment what was necessary, what was good, what was of most value. Discernment, judgment. Matthew 7. And look with him, verse 13. Now, uh, verse, uh, um, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Now think about this for a moment. And again, we don't like, and I just say this for thought, but how many of us hear these verses on a regular basis within Bible studies or the book things we go through? So often these passages are neglected. They're not things that are spoken often about. And yet Jesus, right in the main sermons, the ones that we call the Sermon on the Mount, he begins to say again, listen, do not be misled. The way is narrow that leads to life. Now even taking that idea of narrow, there's, I used to be in that group, everybody else is missing it but me. Mm -hmm. I used to be in that group. And then the Lord showed me the heart of Babylon, Revelation. Do you know what Babylon says? I am and there's no one else besides me. Mm -hmm. Listen, he told Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars of heaven. So it's not us to decide what's a large number, what's a small number. But I will say this, he says, the way is narrow that leads to life, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And here's what the false prophet or the shepherd does. He broadens the way mm -hmm. until we're no longer we're going to see in a moment. He said, listen, in the last days you're going to have a spirit of discernment. And you're going to distinguish between those who serve God and those who do not serve God. Do you realize that the day we live in today, it's so hard to distinguish? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because we're born in America. Everybody goes to heaven. Mm -hmm. Listen, I know that most of us would say, hey, come on. Yeah. Listen, I, I spend my life traveling, and I, I'll never forget being on a mission trip with believers and being so disheartened we were walking through it was a Hindu festival and they were doing all these offerings and burning and incense and stuff we sat in this coffee shop 
I was listening to the conversation. The conversation went to this direction. You know what? Everybody's walking in the light that they have. How can God judge one group just because they call this God? And I, I, I was, huh? I just, I was, I was stopped. And then we got, we got home. I was walking with Rebecca down the road, and I saw. I don't know if we made a mistake. I don't. I'm just shocked. I'm just going to be quiet and just get through this thing. I couldn't. And I got there, and we were sitting together. And I said, "Did I understand everybody right?" Well, then I think everybody knew that. I, I was really asking a question. It got a little. And I said, "Why did Thomas give himself as a martyr in India, if it all leads the same direction?" It doesn't make sense, but we've so begun to water it and change it, and we want we, we have this idea in our mind of what love is. I'm going to tell you this: there's coming a day across this world, every person that's ever breathed and been at a place of accountability, this heart thumper is going to shut down one way or another, and what's contained in here is going to stand at some point before the judgment throne of God. And there is going to be a moment where it says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Even the staunchest atheist will one day say that. I believe, now I'm throwing in my opinion, not because God forces him with angels to say, no, because he's going to see, and I don't know how it will happen, but in a moment, in a second of time, however that happens, he's going to see his life and how every moment a loving God extended mercy, brought people into his life, gave him opportunities, and he rejected that. And he will have to say, it was not you that rejected me. It was me that rejected you. You are Lord. God is a loving God. And even his judgment is rooted and based in the nature of that life. Yes. Matthew 7, he goes on. So how do we know? What does it look like? How do we, you say, beware of the false prophets. They're inwardly this. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree, um, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. So then you will know them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What are you going to do with that? He says, listen. Jesus begins to say, you want to know how to discern? Every tree bears good fruit. Or every tree is known by its fruit. Now, here's an example. For the body of Christ, as we walk together, or wherever you're walking and the people you're walking with, how do we best help one another? One, by being discerning, being accountable to each other, Discernment is listening to what comes out of the mouth. Listen, Matthew 15. The religious people came around and they said, your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. <coughs> and Jesus says, wait a minute. It's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's that which comes out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Later, Jesus and the disciples come to him. What did you mean by that? Isn't that great? Disciples are always asking, what did you mean by that? And he says, listen, guys, don't you get it? That which goes into the mouth, I don't know how it's absorbed into the stomach and it's released out. But then he says, it's that which comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Because what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. Do you want to know what's in the heart? Listen to what's coming out. Listen, you can hear lust coming out of the mouth. You can know what's in a person's heart. You can hear greed. Mm -hmm. You can hear fear. Listen, I, can, I, I, I I'm trying to think. There was an example that was going through my mind earlier when I was thinking about this. But, um, oh, one time, uh, talking about repentance, 
there was somebody that was in my life that, that was kind of like a mentor and things had broken down and, and I, had, I had tried to address it and then it really just blew up into like nuclear bombs. It was totally, I just didn't expect it. I was shocked and then there was no communication about a year or so. Finally, I was with this person and we were sitting in a van together and I said, listen, I could have handled that a better way. I probably should not. I just probably did not have enough life experience to know how to handle that. And I'm sorry if I, you know, for what I've said, the way I said it. I received that. I forgive you. <laughs> Surely that's not where we're leaving this. I, went, I didn't say that. He'd say nothing. Oh, when I got home. Oh. <laughs> I'm telling her back. I'm telling her, going the story, and I'm saying, he said nothing. He didn't even, he just said, I forgive you. I'm going, it was his fault. <laughs> I can't believe this. I'm not, and she's just listening. And finally, when I get quiet, she says, it's not about his heart. It was about your heart. That's why you apologized. <laughs> and she said, she could hear it coming out of my mouth. Further offense, pride. Listen, the way we help one another is by listening. And I am so grateful when people listen. They say, Andy, you said this. You should consider where that came from. What fills the heart comes out of the mouth. How do we help one another? And listen, Paul says, guys, you know my walk of life amongst you. I have lived to keep a good conscience before God and before man. He was not afraid for people to examine his life as a teacher and minister of the Word of God. I should not be afraid for my life to be examined. And I'm telling you this, that's why I purpose to throw all my laundry out right in the middle of the Bible study. <clears throat> my wrestling with my children and my frustrations with my wife, I'm learning to walk this thing out too. But I'm telling you this, guys. You have the right to be discerning. And you need to be discerning. And you know what, guys? Whatever you hear here, you don't receive it just because you respect me. If, if the Lord doesn't confirm it to your heart, you set it on a shelf. Lord, when you confirm it to, you, to my heart, I'll receive it. Why should I be offended at that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I shouldn't. Look with me in, um, uh, when you want to look at what comes out of the heart, Matthew 15. Look with me in Malachi chapter 3, last book of the, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 3 the, the last uh, verse 16 I love this passage then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord gave attention and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and esteem his name Selah yeah, verse 16, it says, Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I have prepared my own possession, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again. Now that word again means there was a time when they had, but they weren't. He says, you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Mm -hmm. Between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve Him. Listen, they were in a time where they couldn't discern. Mm -hmm. But he was saying, in these days that are unfolding, you're going to once again begin to discern again. The righteous from the wicked. The one who serves and the one who doesn't. 
Something was lost. There was a plumb line gone. Now look with me, and this is actually where this whole thing started. Look with me in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. In verse 1 it says, And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up, and trusting him, asked to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Verse 3, chapter 16. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the skies, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and a sign will not be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And they left him and went away. Now think about this. They were asking for a sign, as in something. And Jesus began to say, you know what's interesting? Is you can look at the weather and you can tell, you know what, it's a hot sunny day today. Or you know what, no, there are signs that tell me. There are signs that tell me, you know what, the sky is red and threatening. There's going to be rain, there's going to be a storm. And he says, you can discern these things, but then he says this as a reproof but you cannot discern the days in which you live. Now being a reproof, that what that tells me is that you should be able to. Let me give you some ideas of discerning the days, the days personal, the days in which we live. I remember one time down in, um, we, we canoed, the first time I went canoeing down the Guadalupe. I'd never done it before. The water was real high, running really good. It was actually the best time I've ever been on it, but it was a little scary because I'd never done it before. And, and I mean, the water was running through the cypress trees. It was running hard. And, and finally, we'd gotten to this place where it was just calm. It was just a slow float down the water. And so I was kind of new at it, you know, but the guy behind me is seasoned, and he's good, and the other two canoes. So we were all laying back in the sun, and we're talking, and we're visiting. I feel like I'm hearing something. <laughs> and so I said something. I said, did y'all hear anything? No, no, uh-uh. And everybody just laughs. And we're going further. And and I said again, I feel like I hear something. No, uh-uh. You know, I don't hear anything. Oh, oh I just laughed. I'm laying out and I can tell things are, it just seems like we're moving faster and I keep quiet and, I was, and they're all laid out in the canoes and the next thing I'm going, oh my goodness, and they all look up and we're right in the middle of the current now and the two guys on the side, they went toward the edges. Well, the guy in the middle, he said, well, we're going to have to go right down the middle. And so he starts telling me what to do and I'm doing what I know to do and we get those rapids and the water's coming in and and it was like a cartoon. By the time we got through it, we made it without tumping over, but the whole canoe had filled with water. And we just sank down to the bottom. We had to pull that thing up and out of there. But I look back on that, and it was like the Lord said, Andy, there were all kinds of signs telling me. Guys, do you know right now, and all of us, <coughs> some of us more than others, there are signs that are telling me I'm not going to be here forever. I was looking at a friend of mine my age. He's got a big old head of hair. Mine's all disappearing. I can see all this, you know. My hair's falling out. I can't work out or run like I used to. I feel it more. There are signs. They're telling me, Andy, you need to make sure you're preparing for eternity. That you're focusing on the things that matter. Because your time is shorter and shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. There are signs all around us trying to, God's trying to speak to us through these things. I'm telling you what, spiritually, there are signs that are telling us it's time to focus on Christ. It's time to give ourselves to Him. And He says to this generation, you don't even see it. And you should. We should be a people of discernment. The last 
There's two passages I want to share with you. Hebrews chapter 5. And, and yes. Of yes. What you just said mm -hmm. about that um, boat thing. I think, too, like, it, you were listening to them instead of listening oh, to them. Right. And that's, like, a danger yes. that we have. Like, when we yeah, start, sure. like, looking at each other and stop looking at the Lord and we're, and we know something wrong, like, maybe he's telling us to leave the church or a situation. Yes. But if that person who you think is a good seasoned Christian, like what you were saying, not a Christian, but I mean, whatever, in that thing, they're still here. Why are they still here? Then if they're still here, I should still be here. Because that thing I'm, that for you, he's saying, you need to heed. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's like so totally. easy to fall into that. Just yeah. by looking yeah. at somebody else. And... And what we're doing is we're, we're putting our confidence in others rather than yeah. the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and God's leading people differently. Yeah. You know, for instance, I look back, and, and I grew up in a, in a certain church, and it was alive at one point, and then it just started to become unalive. I just said that. And I look back at all the people I trusted, and they all at times just they began to make their journey in other directions. And why, at one point I did. And I went back, there was a godly man in that place. He's passed away now. Just, he's the one that said to me, Andy, the Christian life was meant and intended by God to be an incredible adventure of faith, but most of the church will never experience it because they won't let go of their life. Amen. That was the last Amen. thing he shared to me when I left Florida. Yeah. And uh, but I sat with him one time and I said, Mr. Les, it seems like everybody that I've really loved and respected has, has left where you're at. Why, why haven't you? And he said, Andy, that's a good question. And he said, I knew when God told me to go there. And he said, as much as I've wrestled with him, he never told me to leave. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, he wasn't <coughs> judging where he was at by what everybody else was doing. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? And so that goes both ways. Listen, the Lord wants us to hear and recognize His voice and follow Him. Hebrews chapter, and this is, so this is one, of the, I want to show you a couple of encouraging things about discernment. Sometimes we feel like, you know what, I'm lacking, Lord. I feel lacking. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. It says, um, concerning Him, speaking of Jesus, we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. <coughs> Listen, what that tells me is... There's a training. David cried out, or the psalmist cries out, Lord, teach me. Discern or, or, um, your senses, train to discern good and evil. And you know what, guys? None of us are batting a thousand. We're walking through this, trying to learn to distinguish God's voice. I'll give you two, two analogies in my life, how the Lord was teaching me discernment. When I first came to the Lord, the big TV Christian thing was praise the Lord. Uh, Jim and Tammy Baker. Guys, I, I, whatever, you know, all that, I was blessed by it. it was I, what I needed as a young believer, they had different speakers, and they had to sit. I would get up in the morning, and I'd watch uh, the, the Praise the Lord show, whatever it was called, I can't remember PTL. now. PTL. Huh? PTL. PTL. And I, but I can't explain it to you. Nobody said anything to me. Nobody came and said, yeah, no, well, I was just a kid. But I remember there was some kind of turmoil going on, and I would hear them talk about it. But then it got to this place where they created these bumper stickers. And if you remember, the bumper sticker said, enough is enough. We're fighting back. As a kid, I was just a teenager. And I didn't know, I didn't know John 3.16 from 2 Peter 4. But as I heard that, something in my heart, it was like, why would they have to fight if everything's in the open? Listen, if everything's out in the open, why do I have to defend myself? That's what was going through my heart. And I just would, and I, the more I would hear, I just, you know what? I didn't go to everybody and say, I don't, 
I just I didn't understand it, but I just thought, you know, I just began to go a different direction. I just I didn't know what it was, but something just said, there's something not right. And then it all came out. Listen, another time, so good. another person that spoke to my life was, was Jimmy and Tammy, ba not Jimmy, uh, Jimmy ba Swagger, you know? And listen, I got a lot out of it. I got blessed by it, and I enjoyed this John Starnes singing and the piano, and I enjoyed him, and I even went to some of the crusades, and he walked back and forth with that microphone, you know? I remember all that. And at my early stages of Christian growth, I was growing. But then I remember later, as I was growing, I couldn't, I, I just felt like I was seeing pride and, and other people be watching and I just, I wasn't interested anymore and <laughs> something just didn't seem right. And I couldn't put my finger on it, I didn't know what anything was. And then when everything came out, it was like I could look back and see, Lord, you were speaking to me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, listen, sometimes God's discernment, you can't always put your finger on it. Mm -hmm. But it's learning to distinguish and listen and to follow Him. The last passage I want to read is Philippians chapter 1. And this was the prayer of Paul for the Philippian church. And I love what you said when, what were you saying when the, the thing didn't add up about the TV people? Mm -hmm. What did you say about that again? Well, it just, it, it, you know, I didn't understand why they needed to defend themselves. Oh yeah, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. Like, you, I love when, that, like, God does such a work in me with, like, that childlike, you're like, but that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like that childlike faith. I yeah. love God to just get to be such a little kid with him. And you know what? Well, well yeah. <laughs> no, but it's like, it's so simple. You know? Yeah. Like, if you tell a kid, I've got all these worries as an adult, and they're like, why? Wow, God provides. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, oh, yeah. Like, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Totally. Totally. And you know what's interesting, too? And I say that in regard to where we're at and in. In those early years, I did not have a doctorate degree. <clears throat> the point I'm making is that as a child, God was speaking to me, and he was saying, Andy, turn to the right, or don't turn to the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. He was letting me know internally. <laughs> Listen, David says, and I, and I was reading the word, I didn't know it all, but I was reading it, he says, Lord, your word, your law is my counselor. It instructs me in the night. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It counsels me. It speaks to me. General Electric Power Company, Philippians, chapter 1. And look with me in verse um, 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it till the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. In this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment or judgment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Now think about that prayer right there. I pray that you will excel in love, in real knowledge, and all discernment. Why? Why do you need to grow in discernment, knowledge, and love? So that, that's like a little square, so that you may approve Prove the things that are excellent in order to be sincere. You need discernment in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. You need knowledge and discernment in order to approve the things that are excellent. 
in the Corinthian church, when he was speaking to the prophets, he was saying, you know, each one should speak in their own order and their time, but they also need to be accountable. So often, here, here's an example of my life personally. I've been going to prisons, and there was something I was sharing going into the prisons that made complete sense to me, and I don't know why I couldn't figure it out the right way, but I was saying, the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. They wouldn't go into the promised land, so God sent them back to walk 40 more years, so they walked 80 years in the wilderness. Well, actually, somebody came up to me, Andy, actually, if you look at the screen, they walked 40 years in the wilderness, not 80 years in the wilderness. I said, no, 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 they walked 40, and then they went back and walked another 40. And he said, no, they, they walked 40 years in the wilderness. And no, 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 no. And here was this, this sounds awful, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Here's this guy in prison telling me what the scripture says. And I have been teaching for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm talking about for three years, off and on I would bring this passage up. And he was so gracious all the time. And his name was Howard. And he came up, one time he came, one time he came up to me, he said, Andy, what can I do? Let me ask you this. If I write it down for you, and I write the scripture, just, would you at least read it? Oh, yeah, Howard, I, I'll read it. I'll let you just, yeah, you feel free. You just write me and, you know, let me know. And so I get this letter from Howard, and I, uh, you know, I'll pick up Howard's letter. I read through this. I read that passage and that passage and that passage. All right. So I read it over again. So I read this thing again. Oh my goodness. That just seems so clear to me. He's right. I remember coming down, and, I, and so of course I had to say, guys, I was saying this, and you know, he was, and he's right, you know. But so often, why do I need to be threatened if somebody wants to come to me and say, Andy, I don't think you're being accurate here. Why should that? Why should I be bothered by that except my own pride? Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we don't encourage the body to discern. For themselves. And you know what, guys, listen, discernment is something as we learn, something we grow into. It's something we become more aware of. Matter of fact, much of the time as we're learning to discern, we find ourselves following the crowd and say, you know what, I knew that. I shouldn't have gone that way. Lord, why did I do that? But you're not going to grow unless you're willing to wrestle with them. And unless you're willing to be teachable. And that means if you miss it, and somebody say, you know what, I know you thought that, but look here. That's the way we grow together. And so, as we finish up, here's just in a nutshell. In Psalm 119, he says, teach me good discernment and knowledge. So part of his heart cry, Lord, I want to learn how to discern. Guys, you need discernment as you walk through this world. Not just as you listen. Here's another, there's a couple of plumb lines I use when I'm hearing counsel and when I'm hearing messages preached. Whether I'm sitting in a service or listening to a podcast, and I do all those things. One is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul said the end result, the goal of our instruction, what we're aiming at with our instruction, is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Is what I'm hearing leading me, pressing me, pushing me to excel in love? Mm -hmm. Is it teaching me to lay down my life? Or is it teaching me to live for myself? You know, um, the other plumb line in receiving counsel um, is, is what I'm listening to. Does it lead me to the cross or divert me away from the cross? Those are two of the plumb lines in my life when I'm hearing something. Because guys, discerning me, even as people are counseling me. I was sitting with somebody this afternoon, and they said, and, and I'm an encourager by nature. They said, Andy, 
I don't want you to tell me what, what, I, what, you, what you think I want to hear. I want you to tell me what you really think. And I was going, okay, well. And I said, Andy, I don't want you to say it nicely. I just want you to say it. You know? I said, okay, here's what I think. And even then I tried to do it as nicely as I could. <laughs> you know? But, you know, being able to know what am I hearing and what is this leading me to? Where is it taking me? Father, thank you for this time, and Lord, only you can grant us discernment. Lord, one of the ways discernment comes is through the time in the Word of God. Lord, it comes to just learning to distinguish your voice amongst others. And Lord, I thank you that you're full of mercy and compassion. Lord, you're wanting to teach us. You're wanting to guide us into truth. You're wanting to be a lamp to our feet. And you want us most of all not to be dependent on our mentors, but to be dependent upon you. And so, Lord, teach us how to walk with you and to recognize your voice. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.